The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome back, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell. This is the Exxon on the Exxon Broadcast Network and the Talk Star Radio Network. We're coming to you from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Toll free 1 800 610 7035. Email xzone at xzoneradiotv.com. On MSN Messenger, xzoneradiotv at hotmail.com. And our website, www.xzoneradiotv.com. My guest this hour is Robert Java Bob Smallsback, and we're going to be talking to uh, Java Bob about Bigfoot. Now he is on the board of directors for a big uh, for Searching for Bigfoot Inc., and he is uh, holding the position of vice president and secretary. He's a businessman and entrepreneur now living in Northern Carol, uh, California. Bob recently retired from a 20-plus year career in the high-tech field where he worked as an equipment engineering manager for companies as diverse as AT&T, that's Bell Labs uh, Technology Division, Honeywell Integrated Device Technology. He has a hands-on scientific approach to problem solving and a strong creative side. His passion has been for developing and running small businesses. Now, examples of these businesses are Bob's Main Street Market, Independent Grocer Services, Indian Creek Cafe, and Java Bob's Bigfoot Deli. Bob was a member of the Technical Advisory Board for De Anza College, the founder and first president of the Happy Campfire Safe uh, Council, and... Um, He's also the president of the Happy Camper Chamber of Commerce. Joining us now from California is Java Bob. Hey, Java Bob, welcome to the X Zone. Well, thank you, Rob. It's great to be on the X Zone Radio Show. It's one of my favorite shows. Oh, thank you very I much. I like it. Well, great hearing, uh, great hearing that. It's always nice to talk to somebody who enjoys himself here in the X Zone. Now, you're you're the author of a of a fascinating book called Monsters, Myths, and Me, which is available at Zone Nation at Amazon.com. Can you give us a little bit of a taste of what we're going to be talking about this hour, Bob? Well, yes, I, I sure can. You know, the the book is about uh, my life uh, um, as a as a real life monster hunter and how I got involved in it and what I've learned. You know. Uh, there's a there's a, a lot of controversy about this subject. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people that are passionate about it and truly believe it, and there's other people that just uh, can't see how it could possibly possibly exist, how it possibly could be. You're a believer. I am a believer. I wasn't to begin with. I started out uh, totally skeptical, um, and uh, in in. My job as president of the Happy Camp Chamber of Commerce, one of the things uh, we did is I called in the county board of supervisors, their economic commission, and asked them how we could help uh, uh, improve the economic base for this little town in far northern California. And uh, they suggested uh, we work on something that we already had in that town and and kind of expand on it. And uh, in doing that, uh, the committee decided on our artistic community because uh, we have a lot of talented people up there. Happy Camp is one of the most remote villages or towns in the continental United States. And uh, there wasn't a whole lot up there after the logging industry went away. But it's an absolutely beautiful place. Well, after this meeting, one of the members came up to me and said, what about Bigfoot? Everything in this town is Bigfoot related. Um, we're on the Bigfoot Scenic Byway, federally recognized Bigfoot Scenic Byway. And um, even your business is Java Bob's Bigfoot Deli. Hmm. And uh, I told her, well, you know, I think Bigfoot's probably a little controversial for the 
for the Chamber of Commerce to get involved in. But if, if you want to look into this and, and see what's out there, I, I'd certainly, on a personal level, support that. Well, she went ahead. Her name is Linda Martin. She went ahead and, uh, and started contacting all the Bigfoot organizations she could find. Uh, to see what you could learn and see if anybody would come out and, and see what we had there and see if it was worthwhile doing. And uh, she did just that. She got online and contacted everybody she could find. But only one person showed up, and that person was Tom Biscardi. All right, stand by. You and I have to take a commercial break. We'll be back in two minutes. Our special guest of this hour, Exonation, is Java Bob whose real name is Robert Smallsback. We'll be back on the other side of this commercial break talking about Bigfoot, his website, www.searchingforbigfoot.com. This is the Exxon. You're listening to us from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on the Exxon Broadcast Network and the Talkstar Radio Network. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Hi everyone, Rob McConnell here, and I wanted to spend a moment on internet streaming. Everybody has heard about internet streaming, but not many know much about it. Did you know the internet streams just about everything? Movies. From new releases to old classics. TV shows. Almost every show, every episode, and much more. But the question has always been, how do you do it? Well now, thanks to the folks at 123 Ready TV, I have the answer for you. They have developed a simple program app, 123 Ready TV, that you install on your Windows PC, Android smartphone, or Android tablet that can have you streaming like a pro in less than five minutes. You truly won't believe how much is available or how easy it is to do until you try. And for a one-time cost of only $19.99, sense this product is a real winner to learn more about 123 ready tv visit our website at www.xzbn.net Hello, I'm Justina Marsh, and with my dad, Pete, we are going to present a new show called Too Good to Be True. Together, we are aiming to discover more truths about this world and beyond. Do you have unanswered questions about the world? Do you ever wonder about aliens, conspiracy theories, or the universe? There are many shows discussing subjects such as pyramids or UFOs, but we want to relay this information based on our own research, including from spiritual means. Hopefully, listeners will be helped with their own beliefs and will appreciate the psychic insights that add to the previous research and information. We both look forward to sharing this insight and beginning this journey with our listeners. Visit xzbn.net for more information about when to listen. Welcome back, everyone. Robert... Java Bob Smallsback is our guest this hour. His website is www.searchingforbigfoot.com. And he's the author of Monsters, Myths, and Me. It's available at Amazon.com. All right, so before we went to the commercial break, we were talking about how the Chamber of Commerce wanted to to, to get involved with the Bigfoot because it, you know you're, of your location and the significance that Bigfoot plays in your little town. And, you, and somebody sent out requests to all the uh, Bigfoot organizations, and the only person that showed up was Tom Biscardi. So let, take it from there. Yeah, I met Tom Biscardi, and my first impression was uh, a little scary. This mm-hmm. man is like a one-man circus. He came in, took over the whole town. Um, very dynamic person. And uh, I was, you know, a little nervous. But then uh, I, after our, our meeting with, with everybody from the from the uh, chamber, I invited him over to my house for 
some dinner and uh, we sat and we talked and I got to know the guy and by golly, he's a he's a straight shooter and uh, he's very passionate about what he does. And I asked him, um, how can you convince me that this creature exists? And I was kind of impressed with his answer because he told me he can't. He, he, he doesn't he doesn't want to and he he mm -hmm. uh, doesn't um, he doesn't work that way. He said, if I want to know about this creature, come out with him when he goes on expedition. Come out and see what he does. See what he finds as he finds it. Uh, and um, make up my own mind. And so I took him up on that invitation. And uh, uh, about the second or third time I went out with him, uh, uh, we actually found some physical evidence that supported a, uh, a sighting that uh, some people that I know that work with the Forest Service up there had made. And uh, these are people that I know to be highly professional uh, educated and uh, very serious people with nothing to gain from coming up with a, with a false sighting. After seeing that that physical uh, evidence, the footprints and uh, and and things like that, uh, I, I thought I'd better open my mind a little bit and pay a little closer attention and and uh, be a little more open-minded. And I started going out with Tom on a regular basis and. Uh, I kept seeing more and more physical evidence to support the idea that one of these things does exist. Now, how long ago was uh, this? Oh, my goodness. That was um, probably five years ago or almost six years ago now. Has, and, uh, I've been across the country many times since then and seen lots and lots of things. And the, the more I see, the more yeah. I'm convinced that there's something out there that deserves uh, a lot more sophisticated uh, investigation. If Bigfoot is out there, how come we haven't found any bodies or bones? Well, um, I don't know that that's really a, a correct statement. I think they found lots of bones. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have on our website uh, a picture of a 9-foot, nine 9-inch nine skeleton that we found. and The DNA came back as not quite human, very mm -hmm. human-like. Um, don't know what that is, but... Usually when we do DNA tests on these kind of things, on the bones that are found, they either come back as uh, nothing on file, unknown animal, or human-like, but not quite human. And so nobody can say that's a Bigfoot. So nobody can claim that as proof that these things exist. As far as finding bones and things, that's, uh, I think they've been found. Um, my understanding is that the Smithsonian has a, quite a few of them, actually, but because they don't know how to classify them, they don't put them out. Why do you think that Bigfoot is so elusive? Well, I think um, from my my experience now with what I've seen out in the field, they're very intelligent. They're very intelligent, and they don't... Uh, they're just very secretive. They're very fast. Um, and they're very in, intelligent. I mean, they can. It appears to me that they can uh, see and recognize cameras. Uh, you know, trip cams. Trip cams usually work either by emitting a high frequency sound or a uh, infrared light pattern to to trip them. And I, I believe that they can see the infrared or hear the uh, hear the, the ultrasound. Mm -hmm. But um, we, I don't know anybody that's been successful catching them on a on a trip camp, but we have seen pictures that appear to be a hand coming around from behind the camera, and tearing it down. So, I think they I think they are just as interested in us as we are in them. Most sightings occur when people are out camping, they're having a good time, they're making lots of noise, they're not trying to find this thing, they're not trying to sneak up on it or anything, and. These things are, are caught in the background when they're filming, watching them. I think we're kind of like their TV. They're mm -hmm. intelligent enough that uh, they find us very entertaining, and uh, they just know enough to stay out of our way. What do we know about their their social structure? Not nearly enough. Not nearly enough. I believe they travel in small family pods. Um I can't say that for sure. Most sightings are usually uh, single individuals, but we did have a situation one time in uh, in Texas where um, someone said they saw a handprint over by a creek, and 
a couple of the guys went out to investigate this handprint, and on the way out there, they saw a large creature run across the path in front of them, and of course they took off after it. Um, not much chance of being able to catch it. I mean, that's their backyard, their terrain. They know what they're doing out there. And uh, they lost it almost immediately, backtracked the, the trail that it left to the path, it followed the trail down the other direction, closer to where they saw the handprint originally. And there they found a set of three footprints that were the ones that they had just backtracked from, the large one, one that was a little bit smaller, and one that was that were a little tiny. So um, I, I have to surmise, although I can't say beyond a shadow of a doubt, that was a family group of three, a male, a female, and, and an infant. And uh, all the information we've been able to glean so far tends to indicate that that's what they do. They travel in small family pods. Uh, the ones that are usually seen out and about are probably the adolescent males that are um, out looking for teenage girls, uh, my assumption. And they see a group of people and they hang around and watch just to entertain themselves. Do you think Bigfoot is dangerous to, to humans? No. No, I don't. I, I think that uh, they've been around. Every Native American uh, and, and uh, Native peoples in this country has them as part of their oral history. They, their, their perception of them varies uh, in, uh, say, the Blackfeet Indians uh, think of them as the protector of the people, and the, and the Apache think of them as an omen of the end days, you know, an uh, arbiter of, uh, mm -hmm. of bad news. But uh, they all do speak of them, and uh, uh, there's not very many stories of them ever hurting anybody, and certainly none that I've been able to verify. There are a few, but I think they're just kind of tall tales. Uh, as a matter of fact, once in New Mexico, um, I was up in the Lucachucais, which is a, a mountain region out there about 6,000 feet. And this is an area that the Diné people, the, uh, the Navajo, had said uh, these creatures come and run people out of there. There's one little water source up there, a little well for their sheep. And uh, people go up there to hunt, and there's elk up there and whatnot. And these people get run down, get run out of the area by these creatures. And uh, working with the Diné, it was a lot. I go up there and check it out myself. And um, we were hoping we could antagonize them and get them to run us off the mountain. So we uh, tried to set up like a, uh, a hunter's camp, but nothing was happening. But one evening, something came and, and shook one of the tents. Um, we, we, we didn't see anything that evening, but in the morning we got up and there were footprints around the tent. And there was a marker. Uh, in a tree where they'd taken a pile of sticks and stacked them up in the fork of this tree that was not there the uh, day before. And the base of it was very moist. And so I assumed that these creatures had urinated on it, which is uh, not unusual for an animal to mark its territory that way. And I thought one way to really antagonize them would be if I were to urinate on top of it. So I did. And from that point on, we never saw or heard them again. And uh, they did not try and chase us off. And the local Dene up there referred to me as the alpha male because I was able to chase them away. So I think what they do is they try and intimidate people. They they do a sway behavior. They do faux charges, kind of like an, an African gorilla, a, a mountain gorilla. Mm -hmm. But they don't uh, intentionally go out and, and uh, go out of their way to harm people. But that's not to say that they couldn't. I'm sure if you were... Uh, harassing a, a young a young one or, or something similar to that, you could get yourself in pretty big trouble. Tell me, have you ever heard any sounds that uh, Bigfoot has made? I have, I have many times. And, I again, I can only assume that these were these creatures because I, I did not see them making the sound. Mm -hmm. I heard the sounds. They were unlike any other sounds that I'm familiar with in the woods. Uh, other people have recorded these kind of sounds as if I, as as I have as well. You uh, send them out for analysis and they come back as no known animal. Uh, Java Bob, we're we're having a bit of a problem hearing you. Uh, you. You keep on fading in and out. So could you just repeat what you just said, please? Yes, I was talking about the uh, the uh, sounds that they make. We've recorded their sounds, and I can't. 
uh, say beyond a shadow of a doubt that these are from a Bigfoot creature because I've mm -hmm. never been looking at one when it was vocalizing. But, but uh, people are not able to identify this sound as any other known animal, and it is very primate-like. Primate so um, uh, the, there are even people that believe they they speak um, speak a language. Now, I have heard on some of these tapes uh, what sounded like words, but I believe that, it, I personally believe that they're mimicking sounds that they hear. They, I know that they like to watch mm -hmm. people out in the woods, and and um, they find us very entertaining. And Bob, I stand by. You and I have to like take them. a commercial break. Java Bob is our special guest. His website is www.searchingforbigfoot.com. Dot com, and he's the author of Monsters, Myths, and Me. It's available at Amazon.com. We'll be back after this commercial break and the news as the Exxon continues from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on the Talk Star Radio Network and the Exxon Broadcast Network. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Hi everyone, Rob McConnell here, and I wanted to spend a moment on internet streaming. Everybody has heard about internet streaming, but not many know much about it. Did you know the internet streams just about everything? Movies. From new releases to old classics. Almost every show, every episode, and much more. But the question has always been, how do you do it? Well now, thanks to the folks at 123 Ready TV, I have the answer for you. They have developed a simple program app, 123 Ready TV, that you install on your Windows PC, Android smartphone, or Android tablet that can have you streaming like a pro in less than five minutes. You truly won't believe how much is available or how easy it is to do until you try. And for a one-time cost of only $19.99, this product is a real winner. To learn more about 123 Ready TV, visit our website at www.xzbn.net. Welcome back, everyone. This is the X Zone on the Talk Star Radio Network and the X Zone Broadcast Network, coming to you from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Toll free 1 800 610 7035. Email xzone at xzoneradiotv.com. On MSN Messenger, xzoneradiotv at hotmail.com. And our website, www.xzoneradiotv.com. Robert Java Bob Smallsback is my special guest this hour. His website is www.searchingforbigfoot.com. He's the author of Monsters, Myths, and Me. It's available at Amazon.com. Tell me, um, what is your opinion or what is your take on the Patterson-Gimlin film of Bigfoot? Well, you know, that's a, that's a really great question. I, um, I have kind of mixed uh, feelings about it. I... Uh, the main thing to me is that the creature never looked like the things that I have seen out in the woods myself. Mm. And uh, so we uh, took a chance to go down and talk to some of the players involved with the film. I met uh, Patricia Patterson. I talked to uh, to uh, Philip Morris, who was the man who claims to have made a costume yeah. for it. I talked to Bob Hieronymus, the man who uh, says he wore the costume. I talked to the neighbors down there and Although uh, a lot of people look at that as the holy grail of Bigfoot, uh, I'm not convinced that it's a real that it's a real uh, uh, movie, that it's a real creature in that film. Uh, lots of questions about it. It's very controversial, and uh, but personally, uh, I tend to think that it was it was probably a hoax. Yeah, well, I've had the opportunity of speaking to uh, Bob Hieronymus several times on the show. And the, the big question that I have that that I try to that I try to make sense of the whole thing, why would somebody say they did this if in fact they didn't? Like there's too many people who collaborate each other's story pertaining to the fact that it wasn't a real Bigfoot, that yes indeed, 
Roger Patterson, who had a very flamboyant personality, was known for this kind of um, <clears throat> uh, theatrics. So uh, why do so many people hold on to this film as the holy grail to the existence of Bigfoot, Java Bob? A very interesting question, and that's really uh, the subliminal message to my book. Uh, many people in this business uh, or in this genre mm -hmm. um, really um, want it to be real. They, 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 this has become their life. Uh, remember when I first came on here, I talked about uh, when we called to get people to to come and look to our little town and happy yeah. camp. Only one person showed up. Tom Biscardi. That's because most people in this genre do all their research, do all their work from the web. They do it online. They write uh, in blogs, and mm -hmm. they, they talk about uh, whatever they care to talk about, and it gives them a certain persona. They become uh, very well known, and uh, it becomes part of who they really are. And uh, anything that is said or done to uh, challenge that position, their social position, becomes uh, a, a negative. And so um, many people who take this very seriously are considered uh, as a real problem for them, and they're, they go way out of their way to discredit those kind of people. Um, they don't want to hear anything that uh, does not conform to their uh, idea of what a Bigfoot should be, even though they've never gone out and looked for one or have no real idea what one looks like or how they act or, or what they really are. So um, it's a pretty involved question you've asked, and uh, it involves a lot of subtleties. Well, you know, Bob, I, I see the exact same scenario I've been doing this show now for 19 years, and I've seen over time the exact same scenario that applies to Bigfoot apply to angels, apply to aliens, apply to UFOs, apply to ghosts, apply to demonic possession. There are more armchair quarterbacks when it comes to investigating the paranormal than there, than there are uh, during any NFL-CFL football game. Yeah, I believe you're right. And uh, that was one of the hardest things. That's one of the hardest things for me to deal with because, uh, like I say, I, you know, I, I come from a pretty technical background, mm -hmm. and I'm really interested in finding out the truth here and, and getting some kind of uh, um, empirical evidence that I can use to show people that this creature is really out there. I know there are a few... Uh, significant scientific people out there who are very well convinced that it's out there. Uh, Jane Goodall has been known to say that she yeah. firmly believes it's out there. And uh, But the majority of the people that we deal with, um, this is more like a, uh, they're the backseat quarterbacks. As Tom Biscardi tends to call them, which is what gets him in so much trouble. Why he's got such a bad reputation. He just comes out and calls them bottom feeders. And, uh, of course, they hate him for it. And if they can find any way to discredit him, they use it. But they didn't, it. didn't Tom kind of shoot himself in the foot two years ago when he was part of that hoax of the of the costume in the freezer? Yes, he did. And, you know, that's not the first time he shot himself in the foot. And uh, knowing Tom, that may not even be the last time. Yeah. Because he is so passionate about this. Now, he was hoaxed. Uh, I was the leader of the team that went and picked up that that body in a freezer, and we all thought it was real until we got a chance to get it out of the ice, and uh, immediately we saw what it was, and we had, uh, Tom had contacted Fox News and said, this is what we have, and we all thought it was the real deal, and um, of course, as soon as, the, the day we found out, we contacted Fox News and said, no, this is what we have, and we were hoaxed by that as well. Um, that's uh, one of the chapters in my in my book that I explain what's going on. As a matter of fact, we just uh, released a a, a a short movie. Uh, it's kind of it's really a rough cut, but uh, it's called "The Anatomy of a Bigfoot Hoax," and it and it describes in detail what happened there. Um, and uh, that's available. You you can find uh, find that on our site as well. But uh, it goes step by step exactly what happened, how it happened, and uh, uh, really we were duped just like. Uh, just like anyone else. 
Tell me, a lot of people within the Bigfoot community think that there is an E.T. connection to Bigfoot. Could it? Could E.T. be an alien? And I've got to let me. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna tell you what I think. I don't think there is an E.T. connection when it comes to Bigfoot. That's just my personal opinion, because it makes no sense. And to me, if it doesn't make any sense, it's not true. Well, um, you know, what I've learned more than anything else since I started doing this is to have an open mind, because I was totally convinced that there's just not much possibility mm-hmm. that Bigfoot existed, and now I believe uh, the uh, that much more strongly that it does. So as far as being connected with an extraterrestrial, I, I, I don't see that myself. Yeah. <laughs> I have talked to people that said, you know, they're associated with blue lights and uh, different things, and that they just seem to disappear and and uh, come and go as they wish, and that's why nobody can find them and everything. But I, I've seen no physical evidence to suggest that that uh, they're connected with extraterrestrials. I just wonder how many of these alleged sightings are wishful thinking. Well, I would say, you know, my experience has been that a vast majority of them are, and they're not people that are. <clears throat> trying to fool anybody. They're not people that are lying. Mm-hmm. There's people that have Bigfoot on their mind. They see something or hear something and just assume it's a Bigfoot. That's why we go out and investigate these things. And uh, most of the time when we get out, we find good people who are telling things that they believe because mm-hmm. this is the way they saw it. Yeah. And uh, they just is nothing there to support that that's in fact what they found. Although occasionally, and it's a much smaller percentage, we do find physical evidence that supports their their sighting. But the majority of them, I think, are just good people who are who are uh, kind of misled. And along with all the other things on the web, when you put that in the mix, it makes it uh, pretty hard to believe that this thing can exist because most of the things can be discussed away or can be proved to be um, just a, a you know a misinformation. What kind of evidence have you seen yourself, uh, Java Bob, to uh, to make you believe, as much as you do, that Bigfoot is real? Well, besides the the footprints, of course, which are fascinating, because uh, there's even been a, uh, some studies done where they took the the footprints and categorized them from as long ago as that they they started collecting these prints, and mm-hmm. they they did a uh, they did a, a stand. They put them in a in a uh, a graph form in a in a uh, uh, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember the term. But anyway, they did a uh, they did this statistical study and they found that the sizes uh, form a bimodal distribution, which shows a large male or a large footprint. Then it starts to drop off in the second peak is a slightly smaller size, which trails off to a very small, which would indicate males, females, and children. And uh, that would be impossible to fake. You know, that that's just something that's harder to, to fake than you can imagine. Uh, I know I, we've seen many fake prints out there, and, and they don't look anything like a real one. Uh, uh, I've also seen this thing with a thermal imager, Again, you can see the outline very clearly, but you don't see it eyeball to eyeball. And I've seen it with night vision equipment, and it's kind of green, and it's running and moving very fast. And uh, again, it's not the same as seeing it eyeball to eyeball. So I've never seen one eyeball to eyeball. But I have seen enough physical evidence. I have seen enough DNA reports. I have seen uh, enough uh, um, uh, intrinsic evidence to convince me that this thing needs to be studied uh, um, properly, that we need to get some uh, some s- real scientific people supporting us in uh, taking this seriously, because there is something out there, and uh, we're all amateurs. You know, mm-hmm. we don't know the best way to collect evidence, and we don't know the best way to to uh, try and track this thing down. Everything we do is trial and error. You know, uh, we're walking down a road that nobody's ever walked down before, and uh, so everything we do is is just uh, uh, the best we can best we can do. You know, you and, you brought uh, up an excellent point. Why doesn't the scientific community get behind 
credible researchers like yourself and give it an honest go? Well, I think there's there's so much stuff on the web. There's so much noise in the background. There's so much misinformation floating around that uh, they really uh, have to um, be able to filter through that to get a good idea. In the meantime, if there's that much question about uh, what's going on out there, they're risking their reputation as a professional uh, on um, stepping out of the, stepping out of the box and, and stepping up and doing something this this iffy, this uh, uh, questionable. And uh, there's not much incentive for them to do that. You know, uh, if you we had a newspaper reporter come out with us one time in Texas. And he saw the creature just like we did with the thermal, not thermal imagers, but well, he saw it on the thermal imager as well. But he saw it with the uh, night fishing equipment. He saw it run through a swamp. Uh, we chased it. Uh, well, he got on. He got in front of his own camera and said, uh, as politically correctly as he could, that he was totally skeptical when he came out. And after seeing something very large, very fast, that digging in the mud and the footprints and where it was feeding, and then seeing it run through the swamp towards the tree line, he'd have to rethink his skepticism on this creature. Well, he said that on TV, and he was sanctioned by his own uh, TV station because he represented a a prominent uh, national news uh, organization, and the last thing they wanted is their newscasters saying they believed in Bigfoot. That would have a negative connotation to all of their news programming. So he got in big trouble for that, and he was just being honest. He was just saying what he saw. So much for freedom so, of the press, right? Well, you got to understand, of course, the press is a, is a business, and uh, they have to pr- protect themselves mm-hmm. as a business. And I can understand that. I don't agree with it, but I can understand it. I would hope that the press is, is I'm more open than that, but my experience has been that generally they're They have to watch out for their own business, and uh, they do. Hey, Java Bob, stand by. You and I have to take our final break for this hour. Exxon Nation, Java Bob is our special guest this hour. Bob Smallsback. His website is www.searchingforbigfoot.com. He's the author of Monsters, Myth, and Me. If you go to his website, you can also sign up for their newspaper, their uh, online paper. It's a great site if you're into Bigfoot. This is the site to go to www.searchingforbigfoot.com. Java Bob and I will be back on the other side of this break as the Exxon continues from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Oh, around the world, right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network and the Talkstar Radio Network. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Hello, I'm Pete Marsh. With my daughter Justina, we will be presenting the new radio show, Too Good To Be True. If something seems too good to be true, it usually is. But with the help of Justina's amazing gifts, we're going to gain insight into questions that don't yet have complete answers. Have you wondered who built Stonehenge and for what reason? Why are crop circles found in the same region as Stonehenge and elsewhere? Are crop circles a hoax or are they created with technologies that we have little knowledge of? Who built the pyramids in Egypt and also in other countries? How and why were they built? Was the Titanic switched with the Britannic as part of a gigantic insurance fraud or for more insidious reasons? What caused the Tunguska event when trees were flattened over an 800 square mile area in Siberia? Will the new insights be too good to be true? Well, that will depend on what you are prepared to believe. Please join us as we start on this journey together. For more information on Too Good To Be True, visit www.xzbn.net. Dreams are our personal gateways into infinite wisdom. 
Don't miss Shamanic Counselor and Indigenously Trained Dream Decoder, Sandra Corcoran's inspiring book, Shamanic Awakening Between the Dark and the Daylight. This remarkable work chronicles Sandra's 35 years of experience with diverse wisdom keepers and her initiations throughout the Americas and across the British Isles, Turkey, Greece, and Egypt. Sandy's knowledge of symbology, psychology, and myth influence her dream blog and workshops. Sandy offers private tarot readings, international journeys, a meditative CD, as well as her book, Shamanic Awakening, to encourage you as you navigate this earthwalk, creating a deeper connection to yourself and all that is. Find this and more at Sandy's website, starwalkervisions.com. And uh, Jeff and Bob, it's been a great pleasure having you with us here tonight in the X-Zone. Um, what would you like to leave our listeners with, Jeff and Bob? Well, I, you know, I'd like to for people to understand that uh, in order for us to solve this mystery once and for all, people are going to have to stop bickering back and forth about it and um, come together. There are people out there who are who are working towards solving this mystery, and there's a lot of people out there who are just trying to perpetuate it as a way of life, as part of their social structure. And um, as long as we keep bickering back and forth and, and uh, we don't take it seriously, we'll never solve it. It's been around a long time. Um, there have been stories about this creature uh, in this country, anyway, ever since there were newspapers, since mm-hmm. the first settlers got here. As a matter of fact, uh, even Rogers Rangers, which were during the during the uh, uh, War for Independence, um, one of our first special forces, in, in Colonel Rogers' journal, he wrote about asking his men to fire a volley of shot over the heads of some bears that were throwing rocks at them. Well, I don't know about you, uh, Rob, but I'm not familiar with what kind of bears throw rocks. Neither but I. I do know that these creatures throw rocks just like many primates do. What so. should a person do, in your opinion, if they see a Bigfoot? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, I would suggest for their own uh, safety, just to be on the safe side, that you simply back away and leave it alone. But personally, I would like you to get as much information about the sighting, the, the weather, the weather conditions, where the nearest waterways are, what kind of food sources are nearby, just general observations, and call me. <laughs> Let me know so I can go check it out. And of, course, know, uh, and, of course, if they can, get a good picture. If they can, yeah. You know, it's uh, getting a picture of these things is difficult at best. You know, uh, a lot of people can't understand why nobody's gotten any really good pictures. And uh, one of the most common animals in North America is the foal. It's just uh, if you've ever been driving down a, a country road late at night, you'll see a little thing scurry across in front of the car across the road. That's generally a foal. And uh, think about what it would take to take a picture of one. Just not very practical. You're driving the car, even if you have a camera right there next to you, you've got to pick it up, you've got to focus, by then it's long gone. It's the same thing with these creatures. They're, they're so fast. They're so elusive. And uh, they also are intelligent enough to know when to just freeze. And uh, the human eye is trained to look for movement. And when there's no movement, it kind of just blends into its surroundings. So very difficult to get a picture. Bob, thanks very much for joining us here in the Exxon. Great talking to you, Exxon Nation. Java Bob, Rob Smallsback has been our special guest. His website, www.searchingforbigfoot.com. That's www.searchingforbigfoot.com. And Java Bob is the author of Monsters, Myths, and Me, available on Amazon.com. We'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news at six and a half minutes past as we continue live and around the world from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on the Exxon Broadcast Network and the Talkstar Radio Network. <laughs> 